Good evening, all. Welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I am Srileka Pale, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Engagement. Our goal through this program, Conversations That Count, is to bridge America's political divide with conversations such as this. I truly believe let's take one small step at a time to kind of bridge this America's political divide. One of the ways I try to do is by introducing the candidates that are running for primaries so you can get to know them better and learn about the issues that they care about and learn about how much they care for America. While the conversations are going on, feel free to chat with us by putting in your questions in the comment section. I'll try to get to as many as I can. Continue to support these conversational sessions by subscribing to Fairfax GOP page. Now let's get to know our candidate for this evening. It is my pleasure and an honor to introduce Judge Jim Miles. Jim moved to Burke from San Diego in 2004. He's very active in the community with his family members. They're also the members of Burke Community Church and is a member of the American Legion Post 177 in Fairfax and is a long-term supporter of the Knights of Columbus. Judge Miles was selected to serve as a fellow United States Congress, House Ways and Means Committee, Subcommittee on Social Security, and was awarded a certificate in legislative studies by the Government Affairs Institute at George Wash Georgetown University. Judge recently retired from his public service as a federal United States administrative law judge. He's a conservative and believes in free markets, small government, faith, family, assuming personal responsibility with a shared duty for the care of those in need. He's a pro-life, a member of NRA, and a supporter of the Second Amendment. What an honor and what a great credentials our Judge Miles has. Jim, welcome to this Conversations That Count, and I'm truly, truly honored to join with you on these conversations, and I'm glad you took the time to see us and talk to us this evening. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sri, so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, yeah, please call me Jim, uh, a judge I just retired. So uh, I appreciate that uh, sign of respect and, and I really appreciate that. But please, Jim is great. Jim Miles for Congress is, is who I am and what I'm running for. So uh, Excellent. Thank you. thank you. Thank you for you being so humble. Jim, before we dwell into the campaign issues that you're focused on, I would like to take some time. Can you talk to our audience about your eight years of service in an Air Force Master Instructor Pilot and also an A-10 A Fighter Pilot? I would just love to know your professional experience. Well, sure. It's funny how life works out. I was uh, graduating uh, with a degree in political science. Uh, Going to go to law school was my plan. And uh, a pilot slot opened up in the United States Air Force. They offered it to me. And I said, yeah, I I'd never flown before, but I thought, that sounds really great. So I jumped at it and uh, within a few months of graduation from college, I was on active duty in the Air Force in pilot training, went through some flight screening to make sure uh, you had kind of the right stuff. That's a little bit of a, an overstatement, but just to make sure you didn't get air sick, things like that. And then I got my wings in 1984 and I did really, really well in pilot training. I finished right near the top of my class and they selected me to come back as an instructor pilot right after pilot training. They call that a first assignment instructor pilot of FAPE. The acronyms are pretty common in the military. So I did that for several years. Uh, I had 22 students, every single one graduated T-37s and went up to T-38s. The washout rate's usually 20 to 50%. So I'm, I'm very proud of that. I think I, I flew the jet well and I communicated well to my students. And I finished that tour and then I uh, was selected to fly the A-10 and I went through uh, RTU, the training unit in Davis Monthan, and then went over to Suwon, South Korea, and flew a bit over there. And then I ended up leaving active duty in 1990. So I was in just under eight years, and uh, I really enjoyed my military career. I was very fortunate in uh, aim higher is kind of my motto in uh, kind of playing on the pilot thing, obviously, but, uh, but it was great. I was very fortunate. Jim, that's pretty impressive. I also saw that you had an year as a fellow on the Republican staff of Ways and Means and also over a decade as a federal judge. What's, uh, what really was uh, surprising, pleasant surprising was you presided over nearly 10,000 cases. That's pretty remarkable. Can you elaborate on that uh, side of your professional life? Yeah, sure. It's uh, after I graduated from law school. Uh, first, I always like to say I passed the California bar examination on my first attempt because it's a really hard and uh, I took it in uh, 1993 and only about half the people that 
took it past at that time. And I was in the lucky half or the good half or however you want to look at it. So I graduated and I was ready to practice law. And then I ended up going uh, to San Diego and accepted a position with the Social Security Administration. And that was in 1995. This started uh, for me a highly successful career. I was very fortunate. Uh, I started uh, as a claims representative, but as an attorney, eventually I was a law clerk. And then I was in, worked on the appeals council. And as part of that process, I was a national manager of at first locally. And then I worked for the associate commissioner. And that's how I came to Falls Church here in the DC area from San Diego back in 2004. Uh, but anyway, the opportunity presented itself for this fellowship, and it was a very competitive uh, exercise. You, you had to fill out a lot of paperwork, do a lot of interviews, and ultimately I was selected. And the Social Security Administration paid for me to go up and work on Capitol Hill for a year. And it was, I, I've always loved politics. It's been my passion. Uh, taken political science classes at San Diego State University, Arizona State, just for fun when I did, I just really enjoyed it. And it was a, a year up there working under the direction of the chief of staff for, and we were the minority party there uh, under the ranking member, Sam Johnson. And I learned how Congress works and, and the staff up there works so hard in the committees. I don't know in the personal offices, I, I did see it and everyone works really hard up there. And then after I completed that, then the ALJ position, and I'll keep it short because I know we have time, uh, OPM, Office of Personnel Management, as an examination and you can apply and you get scored and it's a long process you go interviews you get uh, uh, grilled by usually three administrative law judges asking you questions and then you get a score and then when someone needs an agency needs to hire an administrative law judge like for me it was social security they send office of personnel management opm a request and then opm will send them a list of the high scores on the exam and then they'll be interviewed in the agency will select who they want. So I got picked up in 2010 and went down to Fayetteville, North Carolina, uh, just for a little bit, uh, did live hearings down there. It was a brand new hearing office. So that was really fun to, uh, I'd been in social security already for uh, going on 20 years at that point or 15. So uh, to go into new office was great. Uh, came back here, I went to the National Hearing Center in Falls Church and uh, did video hearings and was back in uh, in the local area. I love Burke. That's where I live. And my family lives married with two children. And I did that. And then again, life is funny. One of the uh, chief judges that worked for Social Security, Medicare took over or was taken over by Health and Human Services, which uh, took the Medicare workload. And I ended up uh, uh, being asked to go over there uh, with my experience. And I, and I jumped at it again because it was a brand new experience. And then I heard Medicare cases until uh, I retired at the end of 2021. And the Hatch Act was over for me, and now I can run for public office. So this has definitely been my dream, and I'm very excited, and it's the first chance I've had to do it. Absolutely. Jim, that is a remarkable career that you have with lots of experience and a lot of credentials. I know you said you loved the politics and uh, after retiring, running for public office, but why Congress? I mean, you have a career politician there with million dollars or more in his pocket. So uh, why Congress? I mean, did you ever think of running for anything else or Congress was your passion? You thought well, you could really make a difference. Yeah, to be honest, I go back and it's funny, back to Michigan when I was in high school, we had a student Congress there. And the students would, uh, you'd compete again, everything competitive speaking, debate, uh, debated for the state championship. I won't say how that last round went, but we, we got to the state final round. And uh, you'd go and you were a student representative or a senator, depending how well you scored. So you went up in the Capitol in, in Lansing, Michigan. And the first year I was a representative and then a senator. And I said, well, I really like this. This is kind of, uh, for me, again, it was state, you know, not, you know, federal Congress is certainly a, a much bigger and, and I wouldn't say more important, but different. So it's, it's always been my passion. And then when I worked on the Hill, you know, I, I've lived up here. That's part of the reason I wanted to get back to Falls Church. I, I got that great opportunity to work directly for the associate commissioner of a staff headquarters job, which is just great experience, especially for Congress or any policy making positions that you're looking for. And uh, yeah, when I was on Capitol Hill, I got to go in the tunnels or right under them. I mean, it's just a fantastic experience. I loved every minute I was there. And how this happened to me personally, actually, I tried to volunteer for the Glenn Youngkin campaign, or, or actually the governorship, because I was very in favor, you know, I voted for him, obviously, and, and I wanted to be part. And when I was talking to some of the GOP officials here, they said, well, geez, why don't you run for Congress? Because you look like you would be a very strong candidate with your background. And again, life is funny. And it was just like, I had just retired. And this opportunity presented itself. And I've certainly been following politics and the uh, great interest my entire life. So I said, definitely, this is for me. So here I am. Um, 
and I've certainly I've worked up there. I've worked with members. I've helped them prepare for hearings. I, I see that I certainly don't know it all, believe me, but I've got a little bit of a flavor for it. And I, I have very little doubt that I'll be able to go up there and hit the ground running and do a very good job of representing uh, my constituents here in the 11th district should they, they see it fit to elect me. Jim, I think if you're the elected congressman, I don't think there'll be a huge or steep learning curve. You'll probably just fit in right there uh, mm -hmm. because of all the experience you've had. So uh, Jim, that uh, your background actually, actually tells me why you picked the issues that you picked. I particularly like that you picked uh, an education topic. Mm -hmm. As you know, our children, irrespective of race, creed, and gender, everyone needs a stellar education. I think you got where you got because of your stellar education and the opportunities you have. But as you know, there's quite a bit of indoctrination going on in the progressive movement. And there's also sexualization of everything in our school. I'm a mom. Uh, I see that happening right in front of my eyes. So uh, my question to you is not your commitment to the education at all. You're obviously very committed. You have your own kids. But I think um, I'm, uh, I'm kind of wondering if you have ever happened to attend any recent school board meetings to raise these concerns. Because what community at this point is looking for is not for uh, politicians or candidates to understand the issues, uh, but also they want to be able to feel like they work, they will work with them hand in hand. So have you had a chance to either attend or talk to those parents about these issues? If so, sure. what was the key take of I'm sorry. Let me just throw out here. I did want to talk about my role as a judge and what I did, but I'll do that later. Uh, uh, perhaps at, I'll have time at the end. But yes, I've, uh, I do have a son, a, a sophomore uh, at a local high school and, and a son at, at James Madison. So I certainly followed uh, the education. I've attended a couple of the school board meetings. I uh, the first one or the second one was the, the protest over the uh, uh, TJ issues, and that was a pretty spirited uh, exchange where they had to shut the, the uh, actual meeting down because of the school board. But, but I guess I looked at the school board, and, and to be honest, I was really uh, uh, not impressed. I, I, I heard this, I just think the school board has developed, and I, I guess I'll just talk a bigger picture, is you've got this Fairfax County public school system is nearly 200,000 students and it covers a lot of geographical area, and it makes it very difficult uh, logistically, I think, for the, uh, the school system to function. Just for an example, if uh, there's bad weather in a small part of Fairfax County, they have to close all the schools. There's no uh, individual uh, parts of Fairfax County. It's so big. And I think second, with the number of people that are affected, and I've talked to teachers, and I heard this now a lot of times, the Fairfax uh, public school uh, members are more uh, activists, political. They're looking at maybe getting to the board of supervisors or trying to get this exposure. And I don't think any of them even have children in the Fairfax public schools. And it's like, I, I just think that's wrong. I, I, the way I see it, and I don't know, I've not met them. I've, I've seen them that, that they're up there for their own benefit, not for my son. And, and that bothers me a little bit. Uh, actually, it bothers me a lot a bit, but there's not a whole lot we can do. So I'm, I'm looking to Glenn Youngkin and Elizabeth Schultz that uh, is handling the education, I think what we really need to do is make it smaller, break it up. And I think we can do that. You know, I live in Burke, all the Burke parents, we have different political views, but we can have our school here and be responsive to our parents and we'd have a smaller school board, but it'd be local and then we'd have more control. Uh, does that answer your question? I can talk a little bit more about Absolutely. it. I think, Jim, you brought up several good points while you were speaking. You kind of spoke about how Fairfax County is so large. So even when uh, when they're implementing these no policies, sometimes uh, it doesn't make sense for us, but it might make sense for somebody else or vice versa. And I think having those... Um, uh, smaller uh, school board uh, uh, members would probably help in uh, understanding the local issues. And I just don't think your district representative is doing a great job representing Bork area by any means. But I do want to throw uh, th things out there saying that my very good friend, Tom Wilson, he was a past school board member. He's working right now hand in hand with Elizabeth Schulz trying to get parents involved. Um, and he's going to be our parent liaison, or he's already in that role, trying to uh, understand what issues each constituents are going on. I think we are in the we are all going to move into a right direction. But I think your observations are super important, and your observations are spot on. Can I add one more point sure, that I absolutely. think is really important? As I look at uh, uh, Miss Reed, I'm trying to remember her name. I can't. But you know, here we have a, what I would call a woke. Uh, superintendent out in Washington that had a small school district 
uh, compared to this one, and they didn't even uh, do as well as we do here, which was poorly. Uh, I mean, they were close. They're both failing in math and reading and science. So why would they bring somebody from Washington State from a smaller district out here other than politics and woke ideology? And you've got uh, you know, I was at a recent Fairfax uh, meeting, The Race to the Bottom, the book, and geez, I, his name escapes me again, but he talked a little bit about a lot of the money is coming into these large districts from places outside the district just to try to get, you know, indoctrination is the term they want to get at our kids. And we have to be careful. We don't need to be bringing in people from Washington. Why can't we find somebody here that's from Virginia and from Fairfax County to head our school? Why do we need to to get somebody from a failed school out in Washington. There's really, uh, in my opinion, and she may be a, a great person, I, I've never met her, but I just think we need somebody locally would have more of a, a shared interest in my children and the children of everybody out there, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. We all want our children to have a, a great education. We love them. They're the most important things to us. And, and the course that they're taking here seems so political. And again, just to me, it indicates that the school board doesn't have the best interests of my family and my children in our communities at heart. And that really needs to change quickly. And, and Jim, you're absolutely right. I mean, bringing someone else from the community may not reflect the same values that we Virginians have. Unfortunately, it's happening in corporate world too, where people think outside, uh, they have to always bring in external sources and they may not have the same commitment to the communities. These are the communities we all have lived in. I myself have been living here for 17 years. You've been living here since 80s. So we know each and every precincts for that matter. So we have much more commitment because we see them in our soccer fields. We see them in our basketball fields. We go to church with them. I, uh, I go to mosque with them. So it's just there is so much of commitment. So finding internal candidates is actually a good one. Jim, if, uh, um, I, I'm not, uh, I don't think this would help um, uh, how you're feeling at all. Uh, for this particular um, uh, superintendent, they're paying another 80 grand more than what they paid past guy. And she's coming from <laughs> less uh, experienced uh, school district, which is a shame. I think it just still brings up that education needs to be reformed in Fairfax County. That's just so Jim, I, absolutely. Jim, I do want to take advantage of your extensive experience uh, in federal entitlements and benefit payments, if I may. I mean, I want to bring up our federal debt issue. As you know, federal debt is uh, frightening. I mean, that's no surprise that we're approaching critical mass at this point, and it will impose a huge burden on our children and grandchildren and thereafter. So do you think amongst many complex reasons, the federal entitlement and excessive benefit uh, payments resulted in part of this mess? I know Democrats blame Republicans, Republicans, but I think both parties contributed to this mess. And also, I think with your experience, what do you think, how do you think we can work to sustain these promised benefits? Because we already been, uh, told our younger workers. Uh, mm -hmm. So how do we sustain those promised benefits and still work to eliminate excessive spending? Obviously, we can't solve the problem here, but I was looking to get your perspective just because you did some work on federal entitlements and benefit payments. Well, I guess my perspective is, is the first thing I would say is federal debt alone is not a horrible thing. Sometimes you have wars, you have uh, things that you need to spend more on here or there. So federal debt, but it needs to be managed and controlled. And that's our problem is we've been spending money or spending money, printing money that we don't have. And we're putting that out into circulation. And what's that cause? It causes inflation. And inflation is what's really hurting a lot of people, especially the, the most vulnerable are the social security, Medicare recipients, uh, younger people, struggling families. Uh, I read, I believe in March, eight and a half percent was the inflation rate. And those people out there, if you've got an IRA or your retirement's account, 8.5% is gone. You got nothing for it. And this inflation is a huge issue. So how does that circle back to entitlements? I did work in social security over 20 years and, and they are so important to people. I took, I started out taking claims, retirement claims, disability claims, and I met a lot of people and I was kind of surprised at how important the benefits are. They're not as much as I thought they were. And it was just so important for, for their lives just to, to live and to function and, and get medical care. And they worked for it. They earned it. And so I have a, a great respect for the beneficiaries. And it's an entitlement. They earned it. So we have to protect that. We have that obligation to them. How do we do that? I think what's really hurting us is these big omnibus bills. And I think it's an excuse uh, by both parties to kind of not do the, the hard work. And I'm really pleading for the Republicans. I think we're gonna take the Senate and the House back 
that we return to uh, responsible budgeting and responsible budget bills. In my vision of that, and uh, again, I worked on Social Security, House Ways and Means, which was more taxes, uh, the budget I, I saw a little bit, but I don't uh, see any reason why you can't start with a clean bill just for Medicare and Social Security and that entitlement. And you pass that, and then you can go after that. What would be our next priority? Uh, it might be veterans, it might be you know military, and I don't wanna get you know too far into that, but you can pass each spending bill and then you can see you know, how much it's costing, how much we might have left. If you have to go into deficit a little bit, at least you have a chance to look at it and read it and digest it. Not this midnight thousands of pages. It's just, I, I just think it's just so bad on so many levels for all of America. And, and I'm hoping that the Republicans, when we take back uh, the both sides in Congress, that we do the right thing. And, and I think we can straighten this out and get inflation under control again, because it's just hurting so many people. Absolutely, Jim. I mean, you sound very hopeful about Republicans. As much as I want to support our own gang, I said every time they got in, I don't think they did much uh, in decreasing the federal debt. Hopefully with um, conscious conscious uh, folks like you, things would start changing. So I always say when it comes to federal debt, I blame both the parties. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, I would just say, I look, yeah, I look back to the contract with America back in New Gingrich, and, and I'm hoping our new speaker will be a Republican, and maybe he'll step up and he'll be the I don't want to compare Newt Gingrich as his, as his own person, but, you know, step up to lead the party to do the right thing for America. And, and I, I certainly hope he'll do that. And the, I will certainly support him 110% because I think it's really important for all of us. Uh, I think so too, Jim. Uh, Jim, before I just started the podcast today, Conversations That Count, I was just listening. I'm not sure how true or this is uh, more of that fake video that was floating around saying that Elon Musk is um, suing <laughs> Twitter. Again, I just, after this podcast, I look forward to actually reading through to ensure that that is actually uh, the news. So while we are talking about that, I think uh, big tech companies come to my mind. I mean, they control the media messaging. If you are the elected congressman, I say this to anybody that's uh, going to be one of those contenders, I would really love to see that you guys are thinking in the angle of restoring an environment where we can have fair and even public uh, debate on the issues all Americans face. I know you're not big on social media. I've not seen you out there on social media. There's always some Twitter <laughs> war going on between candidates and stuff. I've not seen you. I mean, that could be a good thing. I'm not sure how that will pan out. Well, if I could just say, yeah, as a federal judge, uh, I, I was a hatch act and I really couldn't do Facebook. That was just something that I couldn't do, but it did hurt me. I got in the race late because of the hatch act, but that, that's not important, but that's why uh, it really wasn't appropriate for a federal judge to be doing Facebook and Twitter. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, not at all. Absolutely. In fact, that was going to be my other question in later in the conversation saying that, I mean, the candidates solely, especially during COVID world relied a whole lot on uh, social media to get the name uh, recognition. Since uh, we, you, you don't have that social media presence, I was wondering if you had different tactical strategies to get your name out. But I would love for us to focus on big tech companies Okay. So what do you think we can do to have a fair and even public debate on the issues that matter to all of us? Well, that's a, it's multi-level. And, and I think that's a lawyer and a judge. I kind of look at things in, in a legal and, and we're a country of laws. We need to follow them. And, and as a judge, how things are applied to legally and policy is a consideration. And I look at uh, this all kind of dates back to 1934, uh, the Communications Act they passed back. 1934. So it was a long time ago. And they were worried about startup companies and they allowed a provision in there. It's in section 230 that allows these tech companies to pretty much use whatever discretion they want to not put things on, on the air or not broadcast them because there was a fear of liability might hurt small companies. And that's a little bit beyond my expertise. That's my understanding of it. Uh, but the, And they're working on it in Congress now. And I'll get up there and I'll jump right on. We need to revise that section 230 so that these platforms do not have such wide latitude to restrict. And it's always conservative thought. We all know that. They're not going against the liberals. It's just conservative thought. Uh, Republicans, of course, are more conservative. And, and I think that needs to change. Uh, the other thing, and again, I, I'll just mention it. I need to look at it further, is, is uh, the Commerce Clause, the, the, you know, the authorities under that with uh, these tech companies all across the country. And if they... Uh, viewpoint discrimination is one of the more serious uh, 
issues that uh, the law really frowns on. You, you just uh, you can't look at somebody's viewpoint and discriminate against that. We need to get all views out. Someone just said, you know, the clash of ideas is the sound of freedom, that you want this. And so we could consider, and I would uh, believe I would support some kind of a cause of action if you have a Twitter or a Facebook that's intentionally uh, stopping conservative thought because of the viewpoint and allowing people to sue them. And I think maybe that would be a big disincentive for them uh, not to discriminate if they're going to get sued. And the publicity would also get the conservative viewpoint out, perhaps. So I think that would be a maybe a side benefit. And, and of course, the other thing, there's other platforms that are emerging. And, and I hope that those catch on and, and maybe we can you know, find other ways to communicate that are fair. But we need fair and balanced debate so that we can decide. And as far as I'll just segue real quickly into the, the colleges, which I think is, is a big issue as well. In our federal student loan program, I think is something that Congress that we could use to ensure that universities that get federal dollars have some diversity of thought in their institution and in their teaching. It's not all woke. There needs to be conservative thought. And I would also say that if you have conservative speakers there, it breaks my heart when I read that they're getting shouted down and the schools aren't stopping it. They're throwing trash at them. That, that should stop today. And if any university can't guarantee the safety of conservative students and conservative speakers, uh, they should not get another dime of federal money, period. And I think uh, maybe some universities uh, that would either change their ways or go away. And, and without them, I think we're a better country because we want freedom of our ideas and exchange of ideas, especially on our universities. These are our future leaders. And if we're just teaching them one side and allowing just one side in the public square, that, that's just a tragedy for our future. And we need to change it and change it now. It's not getting better. Absolutely, Jim. I am so glad you kind of dwelled into some college campus culture as well. Uh, in fact, I won't go into name of uh, the college that I went to visit my son. Uh, I only saw liberal figures there. I saw Ilhan Omar's picture, AOC's pictures, and I had to write an, uh, an email to advisory board saying that, what about Clarence Thomas? Justice Clarence Thomas is right in our backyard. I mean, this is not about conservative or Republican or Democrat issue. It's like, you got to show both. And uh, he is, uh, for me, he's a legend. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, he has uh, done so much good for the community, not only for conservatives, but I think just community. So what about his picture? Yeah. <laughs> Why do you have yeah so that, that, that kind of being said uh, Jim I want to kind of spend next few minutes talking about Jerry Connolly <laughs> so as you know Congressman Connolly is serving his seventh term in the U.S. House of Representatives representing 11th district and prior to his election I'm sure you know he served 14 years on the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, including five years as a chairman. Um, you're running against a career politician here. First thing I want to know, I'm sure you understood, you read about him, and um, he part, part, probably could have been a motivating figure for you to run as well. Not sure. But what part of his policies are totally disgusting to you? You look at any of these policies and you're like, this is not America. I know I have my, I call it as my favorite policies that he has proposed that I get quite disgusted about. But what, what is it that really was like, nah, this doesn't sit well with me or my family. I got to do something for about this. You know, I guess I would say initially, I've never, I don't think I've ever met the man. I, as a constituent, I read him letters a few times and I gave up on that because his responses really bothered me. But what I've heard, and again, I've, I've never met the man, is when he was a, at the Board of Supervisors, he was a very uh, amenable and he could work with people. And then when he came to Congress, uh, he's changed uh, the way he approaches people. And uh, I can promise you, if you elect me a Republican or Democrat, I'll always treat you with the courtesy and respect because I work for you. And, and I'm not sure that he treats uh, some people I've heard the way that they feel they should be treated. But again, I've never met it or been part of that, but, but I have heard that, but I don't know how true that is. But I guess I look at Jerry Connolly and he doesn't, to me, he doesn't stand for anything. You, you say what policies, you know, I just need to look at the, the far left wing zealots uh, in the Democratic Party and what their policies are. And, and Jerry Connolly votes with them, uh, you know, I think every time Nancy Pelosi. And, and again, I don't want to go down that road as much. What, what I'd rather talk about is policies that I want and that I'll support, you know, should you elect me in Congress. And those are things, again, like reining in the debt, you know, the irresponsible spending. I don't have to tell you how Jerry Connolly voted on any of these. Everybody knows that the defund the police movement, 
one of the most absurd things that I've ever heard of. We need to fully fund our police. They put their lives on the line for us every day. And we also, I think these woke prosecutors and judges and politicians that don't enforce the law of people. I mean, when I was a judge, I knew I had a level of immunity that if people sued me because I, they didn't like a decision I made, the U.S. attorney would defend me and the government would stand behind me. But there were certain things that if I did uh, some kind of sexual harassment things or, or criminal things that the government doesn't defend me for that. And I think we need to look at the immunities that we're granting to these woke prosecutors. And we have one, I think, here in Fairfax County. And if they're not going to do their jobs and enforce the laws and they're reckless, and that's a legal term and the, you know, the devil is in the details that would have to be worked out as part of the process and legislation. But if, if my get hurt or my family gets hurt or my house or whatever, you can go after them personally. And if they have to dig into their own wallet or purse to pay for the damages they cause because they think that they are so woke, they don't need to enforce the laws that we've all passed as a community, then they should pay. And, and I think that might discourage uh, the wrong people from running and it might uh, discourage the people that are up there to, to follow the laws and enforce them and keep us safe. It's all about safety for our families, our children, and our communities. It's just insane what they're doing in, in Fairfax. I keep hearing anecdotal things. It's getting worse every day. And with these people in charge with immunity, it, it's not going to change. So we, we need to address that sooner rather than later again. Absolutely, Jim. You brought up great points about these woke prosecutors. We have an organization called Stand Up Virginia in town, and they have been uh, out there rallying against the current prosecutor that we have uh, against this woke prosecutor. I have been doing a great, great job of uh, getting people um, together to kind of help them understand what uh, what these woke prosecutors are up to. As you know, um, Jim, Jason Miar is our attorney general. Uh, since his taken on. He's been very tough on uh, crime. I think he's receiving a lot of criticism from liberal prosecutors, but he has not backed down. And I think those are the people that we really want, right? We don't want the Congress men or women to get up there and just kind of be uh, wishy-washy about their policies. Uh, mm -hmm. We know it is affecting our 11th district. So I think you already spoke about what, uh, how you feel, but if you are the elected congressman, what do you think um, you can do to work hand in hand with our current attorney general? Uh, to ensure that these are voted out. <laughs> okay. Oh, definitely. I, I'm certainly a big fan. Obviously, I voted for him. But just going back to, to our prosecutor here, I just, and again, I, the devil's in the details. I'm not 100% sure I was campaigning, but I went to the, you know, the first day of the trial for the police officer. Um, I want, to, uh, his name escapes me for the moment, but he was acquitted. They brought charges against this this brave officer that was, you know, trying to, to subdue somebody that was violent. And then there was another example uh, I heard anecdotally where a child was was seriously injured and, and there was no prosecutor available. So the charges were dismissed and, and both of those were very disturbing. Uh, but with uh, Attorney General Miaris, yeah, the, the quote I heard from him was that, you know, he told them, if you're not going to do your job, I'll do it for you. And that's what a leader does in, uh, you know, more power to him. I, I'm, support him 100%. Anything I can do in Congress, uh, I'm with them. Uh, again, our jurisdiction in authorities might be a little bit different, but I'll certainly bring the power of my office with me, what I can do to meetings locally. Uh, I live here in, uh, in Burke, Virginia. So uh, I look to him to protect uh, my family here in our community. And I think he has that in his heart. He's not uh, looking at the last uh, administration in, in the attorney general. We're just quite disappointing. And I think we're seeing the effects of it every day here now. I think, Jim, that, that's what we want, courageous um, uh, elected officials that uh, can uh, say that if you don't get the job done, I'll get you to do the exactly. job or I'll do it myself. I think that's what I think sometimes our Republican leaders are lacking. So it's good to know from your perspective that you're just willing to get your hands dirty and stay as a strong leader. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jim, I know this is not a typical question that I do ask um, uh, our candidates, but I think given your background, I, I wanna ask, I'm a healthcare professional by background, so I'm constantly keep trying to keep up with healthcare regulations. Uh, so um, I was curious to know, will you oppose a socialistic, I call it a socialist single payer government monopoly and healthcare. I come from, I'm an Indian American, I came from India and we tried to do that there. And I also wonder if you support defund funding Obamacare, not just replacing it. I think most Republican leaders keep talking about replacing it. I, I say just defund it and gut it out and start all over again. What, what is your thought about this healthcare system? Well, I guess my 
first thought is, yeah, Obamacare, I, I would vote to repeal it. I, I think it's it's not worthy. We'll, we'll, we'll start from scratch uh, with something else. Everything I don't like to criticize the, the Veterans Administration or the VA because they've been very good to me and so many veterans. But, but an observation I did see when you went to the VA, uh, sometimes for health care, and it was worse in some places, you know, the, the lack of competition and accountability, I think, uh, had an adverse effect on, and it's not the people as much as the management of the, you know, the people are always great that work there, but at a management level without competition, I, I think sometimes things did not get done like they should have or could have. And we've all seen examples, people that have been following the VA, and then they started to open up other places that you could go to get care if it wasn't available at the VA. But my point is there, if without competition, uh, I don't think, and they always, the, you know, the story of, you know, the, the Department of Transportation are going into the, to get your license plate or your driver's license that there's nowhere else to go. And we've all been in there. And if you want to go into a doctor's office like that, where there's nowhere else to go, I, I just don't uh, think that that would be good for America uh, or for our families. Uh, so I think competition is key. So I wouldn't favor a single payer uh, in that sense at all. I think we, we do better with competition. Oh, Does that 100%. answer your question? No, absolutely. I think 100%. I always say competition is the best way to kind of uh, shine ourselves, right? Uh, that's precisely why I'm, I like school choice too. I like charter schools. I think that would increase the competition between public and private. And it, uh, it only benefits the students. And the more students are benefited, the better country shines. Uh, um, so Could I just add one? Oh, oh, just say one more small point, though. I, you know, I would be in favor of the insurance reform. I, I, I think when, when I read sometimes, you know, the cost uh, for things that the payments are controlled sometimes by insurance companies, and I've seen alternatives where uh, sometimes people pay directly. And I'm not saying get rid of the insurance industry or anything like that. It's very important, but maybe some kind of uh, revisions or looking at there might make it even better. But competition is the key. And we need the insurance and we need Medicare because it, it saves the lives of many Americans every day. So we, we don't want to break, we don't want to break it. Absolutely. Thanks for and, that. and Jim, thank, thanks for bringing up our insurance. I think one more thing that we need to discuss about is transparency, right? As much as I'm in healthcare, if a patient comes to me and say, how much are you going to charge me for the service? I know the rate, but I don't know how much insurance will come and how much bill you're going to get. So mm -hmm. I think that level of transparency is extremely important. And if you do that as a single payer government monopoly, that's not going to happen at all. So I'm glad you brought up about insurance reform because that's what we need to reform within insurance companies as well. Yeah, and I have to tell you, with the worst cases I heard as a judge when I worked for Medicare were ambulance cases because now we'll get into the the details, but if someone calls an ambulance for you and they take you to the hospital and then Medicare doesn't cover the ambulance ride for a bit, there could be very legitimate reasons. The person that got the ambulance ride is responsible for the debt and, you know, that stays with them. It's not like there's no excuse, you know, or explanation. And I always, because it really wasn't their fault, but if the insurance doesn't cover it, if Medicare doesn't cover it, uh, you know, that's the way it is. And it's it's not easy and, and it's not right. I guess sometimes you think that's not right, but, uh, you know, we do our best and we have to enforce the laws and regulations and we can always change things the right way if we don't like the results. But anyway, I just, I'm always reminded of that because so many people were just heartbroken that they had to pay for the ambulance. And, I and it's not, sympathy, it's not $10. Anything. It's definitely not $10 no. or $20, it, it mm -hmm. goes hundreds of dollars. And Even sometimes more. you worry if the care gets delayed, if uh, people are just waiting around to see if it would go away, whatever the condition might be, and end up uh, getting into emergency more rapidly. And then, uh, then we have hospital admissions, which cost hundreds and thousands of dollars. So there is definitely ripple effect. And that's why I think I enjoy your experience because you're able to draw from the cases that you saw mm -hmm. to see how you can translate that to policy making. Yeah. Can I make one more point that I think is really interesting that I've, that I've seen in Medicare recently is with technology, there's often new technologies that emerge to treat things. Uh, for street sleep at anyway i won't get into details but medicare it takes time before medicare covers something to make sure it's working and doesn't harm people and during the the, the early stages even if it works great medicare you know doesn't catch up to it but they're working now on trying to get expedited review for new procedures that are very helpful to a lot of people and i think that's a great thing that medicare is trying to do because there's nothing more frustrating for people than something that works 
for them that will save money in the long run for the government and Medicare, but yet Medicare doesn't cover it because it, the, the development hasn't just been proven yet enough. And, and they're doing everything they can to, to speed up the process, which will be great for the consumers you know, the, the patients and I think uh, the government so that we, we spend less by you spending less on uh, things that work. Yeah. Uh, Jim, I, I know, no, that's, that's actually great information. Jim, well, you, I know you, that a lot of candidates hesitate to put that they support Second Amendment on their campaign issues. I say, uh, I always tell to candidates that, um, listen to our Lieutenant uh, Governor, Vincent Sears, who I consider her as the greatest Lieutenant Governor that we've ever, ever had. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I think she's very open in saying that she supports Second I don't think there is anything wrong or you, there's nothing to hide. So I, I appreciate and admire that you put that in your profile that you're an NRA member. However, I do have a question considering that what's going on with our gun rights, will you support a national constitutional carry bill that would allow any law abiding citizens to carry a concealed weapon without a permit? Uh, no, I don't think I would support. I, first, I say I'm very pro Second Amendment and, and I'm an NRA member and I don't believe in I believe in a background check, but not a registry. They don't need to track guns. But the only thing in the devil is always in the details. I think if you get a concealed carry permit, I've got one. Uh, you, you have to show some evidence that you know how to use a firearm because uh, of my military experience. I flew fighters and so I had been trained and, and knew. But but some people may not have you know, enough knowledge or training to be safe with a weapon. And I would think it would just be purely from that angle, just to make sure people uh, know how to use a weapon safely so people don't get hurt. But that, that would be the only purpose of it, not trying to stop somebody or keep track of somebody, but just to keep everybody safer. So that would be my, my rationale behind uh, really not favoring just a blanket policy like that. Absolutely, which makes complete sense. I think 11 constitutional uh, constituents would be happy to hear your uh, response on that. Well, uh, so Jim, tell me, I know that our 11th congressional district is extremely diverse. Uh, um, it has a lot of Muslims, Hindus, Christians. I mean, not only from faith perspective, but also different communities like Asian American communities, Black communities, Hispanics, and you mm -hmm. can go on and on. I mean, have you been out uh, doing some outreach to them? So what's your strategy to get into the communities? Uh, yeah, I've definitely made uh, inroads. I, I mean, like I lived, uh, I was stationed, uh, like I said, in South Korea, and I spoke very little of it, but I won't embarrass myself, but that was a long time ago. And I lived in San Diego. We'd go down to Tijuana and go over to Caliente. And, uh, you know, I love the culture and, and I meet Hispanic uh, folks here. And, and uh, I don't know, I just relate to, them. you know, they can, I guess, tell that I don't really uh, uh, harbor any prejudices in that sense. I, I mean, I just really take people for what they are and what they're worth. I've also met a lot of people now more in the Muslim community here in uh, you know, I certainly am learning a lot. I met uh, in, in, in Iman the other day. I'm not sure. I think I'm saying that right. See, I'm always kind of embarrassed to talk about it because I'm learning about it. But he was, I was just so impressed by him. It was like, you know, I'm a Christian and uh, I love my pastor. You know, he's great. Uh, but if you meet a, a man of faith, I think, anyway, I was just very impressed. It struck me. And, and uh, uh, so it, it just made me think further uh, about uh people of faith in other faiths. And uh, it, like I said, it just struck me. And uh, But yeah, I've, I've been uh, in contact with the representatives from the Chinese American community and they're reaching out to me because I think I have a reputation. So that's, I think the advantage of being a judge, if there is an advantage, I, it was hard to get here and it was hard work, but I got paid to be fair and, you know, justice is blind and, and people would file complaints against me. I never had, yeah, like I said, in a, I'll tell you 10,000 cases, we'll talk about that later, but no, no one filed complaints against me because I really believe I tried to apply the law fairly and equitably. And I don't care who you are, uh, you know, that doesn't matter to me. I just, I get paid by the taxpayers, you know, to be fair and apply it for administrative law. You look at the statutes and the regulations and I won't uh, get too detailed and it even gets deeper than that sometimes, but you just do your best to be fair. But yeah, you can't, Bring your own bias and prejudice uh, into the process. That's not good. It's not fair. Absolutely. It's not right. <laughs> Uh, I know you briefly mentioned about you being a man of faith. I, I say that in all these faith communities, which 11th Constitution CD has a lot of faith communities, uh, 
or actually believe in our tra traditional values. Uh, they are not, they don't have woke culture at home. They don't uh, believe in cancel culture. We are all God fearing, pro, pro life, pro family, very much uh, conservative values. I think it's just a matter of us uh, doing that outreach and telling them that we hear them, we uh, understand them, and we really want to be um, integrated with their cultures too. So I, I think that's something that Republicans have been doing a good job. And I think candidates also are trying their best to kind of get out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny, just in, in my group of people that reached out with advisors, I've got a lot of different religions that I, I'm getting to know really pretty well, you know, just in the last month or two that I had never really uh, known before. And, and it's been very, very interesting and lighting. I'm a devout Christian. I always will be, you know, I, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, but, uh, you know, I also respect uh, other people's faith that there's good people and, and there's one God that we all serve. And, the, and so uh, there's not much more. I don't want to go down that, that path per se. I'll just try to do, you know, what's right for me and my family and respect others. Uh, but religion is very important. And, and it bothers me, the culture wars we see going on with the, the biological males. I, you know, I know it's kind of related to the schools, you know, competing against our daughters and using their sh restrooms and showers. And we saw what happened in Loudoun County. It's just like, this is, you know, I don't even know how to explain it. It's, it's just insanity. And yet there's a certain segment of our society, I guess, is far left. And they seem to have a lot of clout right now that are just uh, really hurting the nuclear family that is just to me central to have a happy healthy uh, society and that's not to say everybody has to be that way but it's got to be the foundation the cornerstone of your society I think uh, for everybody to to prosper. Absolutely. Jim, I know you volunteer quite a bit, I think in some sports. Uh, I, I, I mean, if I remember right, I know you're very active in the community. Uh, and you just talked about this boy, uh, uh, boys competing uh, for girl spots and stuff. Do you hear that uh, outside or is it just as Republicans talking about it? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I always wonder if uh, when you're volunteering in this uh, sports camps, do you hear them talking about this or is it just us? <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you a very true story. And uh, yeah, just real quickly, I play in two Fairfax softball teams, adult league, Fairfax adult softball and the uh, Burke I coach, but my gray haired team uh, earlier this year, we went out and there, there's, I say eight or nine of us and we're pretty much, uh, you know, diverse politically. And, and we were sitting there, we went to, to glory days here in Burke and, and you know, we were enjoying uh, a burger and something after a game. And, and we were talking, I said, well, I'm running for Congress, you know, and I wonder what you guys think about this. And I, you know, I bounced a couple things off them. And then I said, well, what about, you know, boys competing against girls? And every single person was no way. That was just one thing. I was like shocked. I go, I never thought we'd get, I think there was either eight or nine guys and some I, I don't even talk politics with because I know they're very uh, solid Democrats in, in that sense. And, in, in, uh, but yeah, it was, it was unanimous. I was, I still never, I wouldn't say I'll never forget it. It wasn't like life changing, but it was very surprising. Very surprising. I, I think that, that's why Jim, when I'm doing these conversations, I begin by saying that we want to, um, we want to come to a point where we agree to disagree, right? These are the things that, uh, whether it is Democrat or Republicans, we agree that boys shouldn't be competing for girl spots. Uh, we want to make sure we do, you know, we focus on meritocracy. That's what America was built on. So there are some things that we can disagree on because those are basic tenets of, uh, I call it as Americanism. I think that's where I think candidates should go out there and meet these folks and say, where do we meet? Uh, we, we don't have to always fight about um, pro-life, pro-choice. It's not as simple as that. It's just, let's come to together. Yeah. So Jim, you're obviously a very, very good candidate. I am, uh, I'm in awe with your credentials. I mean, it's oh, just you. an honor to have a judge, a retired judge on the ballot. I think hopefully people see through that, but there are other candidates that are all out strong candidates in their own view. So what is your strategy for winning primaries? How are you, you don't have to tell me trade secrets, but uh -huh. just an overall um, uh, strategy. How are you trying to win these primaries? Well, I, I, I guess I'm, I won't mention names, but I'm fortunate to be getting some advice from some very seasoned political figures. And the big thing that my campaign manager, Colin Grode, has been helping me out a, a great deal. And we've targeting the people that are going to vote in the primary. And there's areas in Burke here. I mean, if we can carry Burke, you know, that would be enough to win the primary. So 
Uh, you have to, you know, pick your fights, pick your battles, but you, we only have so many resources, so much time. I've got a, my own, they're all my volunteer staff, just my, my lifelong friends that are helping me out. But we're, we're focusing our attention where it needs to be on, on potential voters. And we're just getting a lot of positive feedback because people are scared of the border situation. I mean, who knows who's coming over, right? It's just crazy what's going on and, and where we live. Uh, you know, who knows what they're bringing over drugs and, and, and it's just a dangerous time for America and there's really no reason for it other than the, the politics of the left and, and boy, I, I pray every day it stops because it's really getting, I think, reaching uh, nuclear mass, uh, if that's the right term for it, and, and I think people are scared. Absolutely. So, Jim, what about, um, uh, let me go back to saying your friends are helping out. I ran for an uh, office in the past, and I'm telling you, for the close friends and family that have been with you for the last decade or so are the first people that would buy into what you're trying to say, because they know you as a person. I think you're relying on right people, Definitely. and you're also relying on good advisors. So you're in the right path. It's just a matter of understanding who your delegates are and seeking out their support. So Jim, are you also looking into some endorsements? Um, I know that uh, your um, uh, some of the candidates in primaries have gotten some endorsement. Is that a route you're taking as a strategy? No, I guess my personal and I've heard on the campaign trail some, you know, some endorsements like I don't know who these people are. So, you know, if you endorse that person, how do I, you know, you might endorse me if you knew me. So I don't think that much, uh, you know, and, and that's why the primary, you, you, nobody I, I think of that's important in the Republican establishment in Virginia, uh, with rare exceptions, is going to want to endorse somebody in a primary, at least publicly for obvious reasons. So no endorsements. So now, if I get the Republican nomination, which I hope to, then I, I'm certainly hoping for endorsements. I've been talking to a lot of people, I think, that are very interested in, in giving me endorsements and getting behind me. But yeah, I understand that the primary is a, I could you know, not win on May 7th and, and I'll certainly be crushed, but life will go on and there will be another uh, you know, torchbearer to go against Jerry Connolly, who I'd fully support in uh, for somebody that had endorsed me, uh, that would just make it difficult. And I, so I don't, I, I'm not really seeking them out. No, I don't think that's good politics. And I just don't think it's that important at this point. And that's good to know. I think everybody has different views. And that's why I was trying to kind of get, understand your views. And also, Jim, a BPAP results are in Jerry Connolly has raised over a million dollars. How do we beat these cash machines? I think for anybody of my friends, I call them as immigrant and my own immigrant friend circle. When mm -hmm. they say, sure, Republicans have a lot of money. I said, did you ever see what Democrats raise? Uh, um, I don't. I think we are somebody that would that definitely continue to struggle with fundraising. Raising. So uh, is there a strategy for raising funds or how are we going to go against this cash machine if you don't have the dollar, enough dollars? Well, I guess the first thing I'd say globally is, is you might have a million dollars, but how are you going to spend that? I mean, sometimes they might spend it on other races. Is he going to pour a million dollars into the 11th district? I mean, that's a lot of money. This district's big, but it's not that big. I think you can compete in this district for less money than that and competitively what if he has 100 million is he going to pop, you know put 100 million into the 11th district you reach a point where there's no return on your investment so i just need enough money to get my message out in the 11th congressional district and i think i can do that i'm already uh, gaining traction in the fundraising i've got some sponsors now uh i'm having an event uh the first week of may uh in springfield and more details will be coming out to that if uh, we don't have enough room for uh, for everybody that uh, I think would like to attend, but I think it'll be a good event in, in more to follow. But yeah, we're getting there in, uh, we're picking up speed. And I, I'm fully confident that the Republican establishment, you know, once, uh, and I hope to win this primary, then they can line up behind me without uh, concern. Because I, again, I understand in the primary, it's, it's just too difficult uh, and politically unwise to and without maybe in a very rare exception to, to endorse anyone. So I'm fine with that. Sure. We'll get there. I think that's a very pragmatic way to look at it for sure. So Jim, uh, we are at the end of the, our conversations. I mean, an hour goes by real, really quickly. You were, um, you were very articulate in talking about education, the woke censorship, big tech industry, some healthcare. We, did, we got a chance to speak about those mm -hmm. or how you're going to take care of these woke prosecutors and so on and so forth. But um, let me, let us, no, let our viewers know if I missed asking you any key policy positions or if you feel like hmm, that was the issue that I was running on and I would love mm -hmm. to take uh, this opportunity to talk to our voters about it. 
Let me just uh, uh, refer to earlier about my uh, duties as a, as a federal judge. I kind of told how, how I got there. But in Social Security, uh, I would conduct a hearing, and I did several thousand of those. I, I don't know. I lost track, but I did that for four or five years. But yeah, you would, a uh, person filing for disability mostly take their testimony and they'd tell you, you know, what their medical problems were. And then you'd hear from a vocational expert, maybe a medical expert rule on evidence. And then you decide whether they met disability or not, or maybe later on said, anyway, it gets uh, technical, but then the same in Medicare. And, and you know, our, our goal there was a thousand cases a year. It was a, they were a different type of cases than the social security disability cases, but yeah, those involve parts A, B, C, and D, uh, prescription drugs, uh, hospital stays, uh, dialysis, uh, uh, Medicare Advantage, all that. So, so I heard a lot of cases and I met a lot of people and it was a, a very humbling experience because you see that how, co how complicated things are, the enormity, and, and I did my best. A lot of it was fact finding. So, uh, but I'm very proud of the work I did for Social Security in, in the Office of Medicare Hearings and Appeals. And, and I, I look back fondly on it and I really never had any any problems or issues because I, I, I always try to treat people with respect because I work for them. And uh, if I'm lucky enough to be elected uh, as a representative of the 11th district, I work for them. They're going to hire me to, to work for them on the Hill. And I've been up there and I really enjoyed it. And it seems like there was another small part to your question. I can't really think uh, anything more. Well, I, I think you you pretty much answered. I was just- Oh, I know what it was. Me. No, uh, just let me finish. I, just, I always want to caution. Uh, you know, as a judge, I've always been, uh, you let other people talk and, you know, I was an evaluator and I weighed the evidence. And if I had a specific question, now that I'm running for office, I'm, I'm doing a lot more talking. And I, I, as, an, as a newcomer uh, to this, sometimes I'm afraid that I talk a little bit too much and I don't want to say the wrong thing or offend somebody. So if I did the, any of that tonight, I apologize in advance, but hopefully okay. I'll get better and, and it's important. I, I think to, to, you know, be who you are and stay on your message and tell people what you are and not get too far off into things that, that really aren't important that might detract from what's really important. And I hope I convey to, you know, your listeners and viewers today, what I think is really important for our families and our communities here in the 11th district, because we need change here. Uh, it's just not going well. No, this is great, Jim. Uh, Jim, can you also take this time to talk about your website and, uh, Oh, um, sure. about, uh, about our date, to the, the main date that they have to come oh, in. Excellent. And Thank you. Yes, my website is milesforcongress.com. That's miles with a Y for congress.com. My uh, Gmail, milesforcongress at gmail.com. Uh, the primary is May 7th. Uh, let me grab information here just so I make sure it's at University of North America. And that's 12750. That's 12750 Fair Lake Circle in Fairfax. It's kind of over by the Fair Lakes Mall. It's on May 7th, which is Derby Day. So if the Kentucky Derby is running that day. You know that's the day you got to get out and vote for Jim Miles. And it's open nine to four. You just need to be an 11th Congressional District uh, registered in the district and have a photo ID, no pre-registration, nothing like that. You just go up. It's like an office building. And uh, please come out and vote for me because if I don't get past this primary, uh, then I can't take on Jerry Conley. And I honestly believe that I have the background and experience in, in uh, the age <laughs> really to, to be competitive against them. And, and I've, uh, as a federal judge, people, uh, I think they can see in me that I'm not trying to, you know, deceive them or lie to them. I'm just honestly, because I didn't have to do this. I just retired. I was not planning on doing anything, but I took a train trip on Amtrak out to visit my 94 year old mom out in Colorado. Never took Amtrak, went all the way to San Diego. But anyway, my point is, and then I got back and here I am running for Congress because I believe in this and it was not on my radar, but it is now and, and I'm here to win it in uh, for us in the 11th district and, and beyond. I think it's important we take our country back. Absolutely, Jim. We have one of our viewers saying thank you for running. Keep up the energy. I hope you win. And thanks for addressing the issue. So you're obviously in a great track right here. So, Jim, I can't thank you enough. I have to say Judge Miles one last time. I no, think thank you. Respect that you deserve. Um, I sincerely hope that uh, uh, all of our candidates are great. I always say, may the best one win. I live in 11th District. I have a vested interest in getting Connolly out. And uh, we are here to support Fairfax GOP, has always supported the candidates, whoever gets on to their primaries. Uh, uh, once you're off from your primaries, we are out there hand in hand working with you. Uh, to get you to the fans. Uh, so um, I thank you for joining and I thank you for taking the time out of your busy family life. I know you have kids, you have wife, you're very active.
active um, in community and stuff, but thank you for taking the time. I hope you continue to campaign aggressively up until our date. So viewers, thank you for listening to Conversations That Count. Uh, that was one great candidate. That was a great interview. Next week on Sunday, May 1st, we will have Matt Chapel. That would be our final 11th congressional district candidate. So you get to hear all of them before the primaries. Matt will be with us on, at 6 p.m. on May 1st. I hope you all will tune in. I also would like to say that May is Asian American Month. So we are going to bring in a lot of Asian community influencers that are going to talk Talk to us about American values and why they came to America and why they're fighting against this woke censorship and so on and so forth. We, you also will get to hear from another 10th district candidate. So lots coming out in uh, May. So please continue to stay tuned and continue to support our candidates. Uh, Jim Miles for Congress again, please share this video far and wide unless you share other constituents in 11th district that could not tune in, will not get to hear Jim Miles' uh, great accomplishments and his issue um, he, uh, and his take on issues. Can so I say one more thing? A hundred percent. Yeah, uh, 560 uh, KBLU tomorrow. I should be on the radio at uh, 905, I think, to about 925. Uh, uh, should be a national syndicated. I was just on uh, WMAL on, on Wednesday uh, with O'Connor and company, and that podcast is available online uh, Wednesday morning at 7.05. I, I appeared there, and, and you know, that's more, uh, I think you'll see I'm pretty consistent because this is what I believe. This is why I'm doing it. So, and I thank you so much for having me today. You made it very easy. I really appreciate uh, how gracious you are and your questions were, uh, uh, I think, uh, probing and thoughtful, but fair. And I thank you for that. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that and hope to see you on campaign trial. Uh, have a great evening, rest of the evening. God bless you all. God bless your campaign and God bless America. Thank yeah, you. Exactly right. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everybody.